Hi, I'm Roger Becky from the University of British Columbia, Earth, Ocean and Atmospheric Sciences. I'd like to talk to you today about some of the work that we we're doing in drainage from waste rock and encourage you and appeal to you to work with us and we can hopefully help you with some of your mine drainage problems. What's the objective of our research program. It's to provide a knowledge base to support waste rock management and decision making for communities, for regulators, and for mine operators. We're looking at um, understanding and predicting drainage through time, um, understanding the mechanistic relationships, what controls drainage that can lead to operational planning methods, how to design dumps, where to segregate waste, etc. Then also how to plan for closure, prediction and planning, what kind of liability, what kind of long-term drainage, and what are the effects of that. I view this as a scale problem, and this is uh, a lot of my background is working with these scale problems. You can think of at the mine feasibility stage, there is no mine, we don't know what the climate's going to be, and typically what's done is we collect a few samples. They may or may not be representative, depending how heterogeneous the system is. We still don't know what's, what's underneath in the ground. We take them to the laboratory and we do relatively small scale, so they don't cover the full heterogeneity of the system, and relatively short duration tests, looking at leaching characteristics, etc. On that basis, we make a go-no-go -no -go decision uh, it feeds into the go no go decision for the mine feasibility of course with all the intendant uncertainty and risks which are probabilistic costs then typically what you see is once a mine is going then the operators are thinking about closure and the regulators are asking for more information going to for closure and then typically you get larger scale field type experiments such as field barrels these are more representative, uh, they're in natural climate uh, versus a lab laboratory setting, but they're still very small scale and they don't contain the, some of the processes that occur in mine waste, in waste rock in particular, which include things like gas transport, heat transport, and complicated flow. Waste rock is much more complicated than tailings, mostly because they are stored, waste rock is typically stored above the water table and there's a very large heterogeneous grain size distribution and heterogeneous materials in contrast to tailings which tend to be relatively uniform size and are often stored subaqueously. We found that these field barrels were inadequate. They do not fully manifest all the processes. So we've also developed these experimental waste rock piles at larger scales here at the Antimina mine and, and earlier in Saskatchewan at the uranium mines. And last, we'd like to compare them to full scale mines and full scale dumps, but that takes a long time. The larger the scale of the problem, the longer it takes to see what's going to happen. So that's the nature of the scale problem. We have to extrapolate from these relatively small scale, short duration tests to large scale long-term duration effects. And there is natural heterogeneity, which confounds us. And there is, in particular in waste rock, there's multiple processes, heat flow, fluid flow, both uh, gases and liquids, uh, geochemistry, microbiology. So what's our strategy? Well, these large experiments, they're great. They're more representative, not entirely, not, not the full scale, but they, they're expensive and they take a long time. Small scale experiments, uh, uh, you need to do some and you need to look at the geology, but they are not representative and they don't manifest all those processes. So we are developing a framework where we can integrate this together using our mechanistic understanding and mechanistic models to extrapolate to large scales and long time periods. And the thing that we do particularly well, I'm proud that we do at UBC, is integrate all this together in EOS. So mineralogy is fundamental. You have to understand the geology and the mineralogy. And then the suite of tests at the lab scale, uh, field barrel tests, these experimental piles, which again are longer term and, um, and expensive. And then we can also look at, or we are, have looked at, what kind of engineering manipulations can we make in terms of either segregation of material or the design of the piles, including covering the piles to reduce either infiltration of water or reduce gas flow. Um, 
so gas monitoring, microbiology. And then um, I want to give a shout out to my colleague, Uli Mayer, whose model, MIN3P, is probably the best in the world for an analysis of these problems. And I've been fortunate to be able to work with Uli for almost 20, more than 20 years now. Our first work that uh, I started with Leslie Smith was in the uranium mines of northern Saskatchewan. And here you can see this red dot, so that was the location of the mine. This is the Clough Lake mine. This is Craig Nickel. And the, this is this experimental waste rock pile where we captured all the drainage that came through the pile. We have a complete uh, water balance. And you can see at the bottom, there's a, a system of pipes and uh, lysimeters. The bottom is portioned off into little cells. And we could measure the flow and then collect samples from each of these cells and then understand what is happening in the waste rock. We, we, at the Antimino mine, where we've been working since 2005, we've had to go to much larger scales and a much more ambitious project because the waste at Antimina, the rock types are much more complicated. So we have five experimental waste rock piles, much larger in scale. We also did the mineralogical lab scale field barrel. And also at Antimina, we're fortunate to have full scale data from the piles in terms of boreholes. And to give you a sense of the, the, at the base of each one of those five piles is this lysimeter, 36 by 36 meters. We could capture all the water that was draining out of those piles collect samples and understand what's happening. And again, you know, there's a, there's a person over there so you can get a sense of the scale of these, these experiments. Nevertheless, it's still small. It's the, we still, for a large mine like Antimina, where it's very heterogeneous, we cannot capture everything in those small scale test piles even. So this gives you a sense, here's the scale of the test pile and here's a, the, the scale of the typical Antimina pile. We get lots of data. Uh, we've got uh, we've been super fortunate uh, to work with Antimina and uh, look at their data, and we integrate that data with our mechanistic models to make predictions about the the drainage from the piles. Where are we are right now? Well, I think we have a decent understanding of the processes that are operating in waste rock piles, the, more, the important processes. And by looking at the mineralogy and grain size distributions and the climate, we, we, can have a, we have a decent understanding of what's gonna be important. What, we, what is still remains to be done is how to properly integrate the data that we can collect into these uh, process-based models to, cal to both calibrate them and parameterize them properly. This is sort of the data science theme that's, that's working here in this BRIM project. And so what we would like to do is use this mechanistic understanding and plug it into the, our framework. And our framework is the full meal deal, which is from looking at the mineralogy to the mechanistic modeling. And layer on top of that, this a probabilistic data science uh, framework to manage uncertainty and to characterize the uncertainty in the processes. And this is, uh, this is the way things are going in earth sciences where mechanistic models are mated up with data science approaches. And that feeds into the ultimate goal is decision making and the decision analysis framework that's, that's well known in engineering, this is an example of it, is you've got a problem. So in this case, you're trying to make a decision about groundwater contamination. So this is a groundwater plume and it's moving off from left to right. And you have some options. You could do nothing, you could excavate, or you could put capture wells. And each one of those decisions, there's uncertainty because there's natural heterogeneity, there's a variability in the, in the future, so there's risk involved. And the decision is typically made in an economic framework. And you can think of a risky design as one that is typically low cost, but it may not work. And when it, when it doesn't work, there's economic consequences. And so that's the idea of risk. Whereas on the other side, a conservative design, you you engineer it very, very well, but maybe you overspend and therefore your costs are high, your risks are low. And so you want to find that optimum, that optimal risk. This is just to say that we understand this framework uh, in, in decision making. What we do not have a good understanding of though are the costs and the economic context that miners uh, face, the, the, the economic uh, uh, trade-offs and environmental trade-offs that decision makers in regulatory agencies and communities make. 
So my appeal is for partners, both the industry partners and community and regulator partners that can help us further this research, this uh, predictive framework that's, that includes all this, the, the empirical data collection, the data analysis, the mechanistic modeling, and then this decision probabilistic framework. And again, I'm fortunate, I'm just the one who gets the call on the lion to roar, but there's so many characters, so many people behind this research, uh, that I can't name them all. This is just a slide that's showing some of the people that worked on the Antamina project. And again, I want to um, uh, highlight the, the contributions of my colleague Uli Mayer uh, in the mechanistic modeling. Thank you.